In part one of this new series, we looked at God's relationship with Abraham as it related to the journey. In this episode, we get to look at this in connection to the Apostle Paul and what God was inviting him to as it related to his journey. Friends, hello there. Welcome to part two of our new mini-series on the journey. In part one, we unpacked why we're calling the series The Journey as it relates to who God is. And we just said that God is the God of the journey, not the destination. And so the question that we've been asking out of this is then how do we journey well? How do we adopt a journey mentality? What gets in the way? What prevents us from being able to to embrace this facet of who God is as it relates to us and how do we journey well through life when God typically doesn't give us a manifest, doesn't lay out all the details, doesn't give us a roadmap of the destination, but but invites us into the journey. And so that's what we're tackling throughout this series is in each episode trying to find what is another way that we can better engage the journey and live into a journey mindset. And so I want to look at the Apostle Paul during our time today. And his first missionary journey begins in Acts 13. And notice how it is recorded. It says, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul, Saul will become Paul, for the work to which I have called them. So after they fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. So it just says that the Holy Spirit says, Set them apart for the work work which I have called them. Uh, It doesn't say that the Holy Spirit said, This is where you're going to go and this is what you're going to do. Uh, As the narrative continues, the two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. Now, again, it doesn't explicitly say that the Holy Spirit sent them to Cyprus. Uh, Perhaps the Holy Spirit did, but in the way that it's recorded, it's not explicitly stated. And the reason why I highlight that is that if we look at this first missionary journey, and let's talk about just the first half of the journey itself, is that they go first to Cyprus. And what we find in the book of Acts is that Barnabas is actually from Cyprus. Barnabas's cousin, John Mark, is also with them, at least up until Perga. And he is most likely from Cyprus, being a cousin of Barnabas. And so when they start off, it seems like this would be a good place to go. Um, They go to Salamis, then they end up at Paphos. They meet a guy by the name of Sergius Paulus, which we find out from archaeological record as well as Roman record, is that Sergius Paulus, who is the governor, is actually from Pisidian Antioch. And so all of a sudden, once they meet Sergius Paulus, It's like Paul and Barnabas are on a straight shot for Pisidian Antioch. And then they get to Pisidian Antioch and they're hanging out there for weeks until they get ran out of town and then they just follow the Roman road to the next site, which is Iconium. They get ran out of Iconium. They go to Lystra. Paul gets stoned in Lystra from people who are ticked off at him who are in Antioch, because then they hike to Iconium, pick up people in Iconium who are ticked off at Paul, and then they go to Lystra, and then that's where Paul gets stoned, is in Lystra. And so then they get ran out of town, if you will, from there, and they go along the Roman road, and they come to the next city, which is Derbe. And so when you just kind of look at the trajectory of all of this, you go, it doesn't seem to be that the Holy Spirit laid out a road map It's that they're almost kind of living life by leads. They're going, okay, well, I think we should go here, and this seems right, so we'll go here, and we'll see how that goes. And then they get there, and they go, and I think we should go over here. And it appears this is how this first missionary journey is unfolding. And they get to Derby, and what would be the most commonsensical thing to do would be to follow the Roman road down into Tarsus, swoop around back to Syrian Antioch, and they're back at home base. But they don't. In fact, they retrace their steps. And Paul will say, we have to go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of heaven. 
he recognizes that he's supposed to in some way keep investing in the same groups that he's already been investing in. And so he retraces his steps, goes back to Perga from Italia, goes back to Seleucia, and then finishes back at home base of Antioch, and the first missionary journey concludes. When you look at what they go through, it's like they went through hell and back, especially with that stoning in Lystra. And then the second missionary journey comes along, and we find out that Paul and Barnabas have a disagreement. And so then it says, But Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. So Barnabas and John Mark are going to go back to Cyprus. Paul is going to pick up Silas, and then they're going to do a second missionary journey, or at least it's a second missionary journey for Paul. And when it says that they went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches, these are churches that Paul has already planted. This second missionary journey begins as a follow-up missionary journey. And then we get that Paul is going to end up in Lystra, and then he's going to get Timothy. So Timothy is going to become a disciple of Paul. And then we read this in Acts 16, 6-7. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. Just notice this. The Holy Spirit kept them from where they were going. Then it says, When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. Let's just pause for a quick moment. Is this agitating you as much as it's agitating me? Paul goes through hell and back on this first missionary journey. He has a sense that he needs to do a second journey. And he's like, I feel like we need to go here. And all of a sudden it's like, no, you're not going there. Well, I guess we're going to go here. No, you're not going to go there. It's like, Jesus, what are you doing with him? He has given his life to you. You met him on the road to Damascus. He is an all-in follower of you. And yet even here, God isn't downloading to the great apostle Paul the itinerary for the second missionary journey. It continues. It says, So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over here to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we, because Luke is recording this as part of the we narrative, got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. It's like they said, well, I guess this is where we're supposed to go. On a map, let me show you what has unfolded. So Paul and Silas leave Syrian Antioch. They go again through Syria and Cilicia strengthening the churches. It's a follow-up missionary journey. And from Antioch, they're trying to go west to the province of Asia. And it says that the Holy Spirit prevented them from going there. And then they're like, okay, well, I guess we're going to go up to Bithynia. And then it says the Spirit of Jesus prevented them. And I don't understand, like, Holy Spirit, Spirit of Jesus. Like, why why is that there? I know some of you are going to ask me. I don't know. There's lots of fun commentary and debate. But the point is, God says no. And they're like, well, then if we can't go here, and then we go here and we can't go there, then we're going to end up, and they're at Troas, and then they get a vision to cross from, from where they are at in Asia to go to the continent of Europe And this is where the second missionary journey, the majority of Paul's time is going to be. He's going to be 18 months at Corinth. But this is just one of these things where you go, man, what is going on here? Well, Abraham will tell you. Moses will tell you. David will tell you. Elijah will tell you. Paul will tell you. They understood something fundamentally true about God. Is that God is a God of the journey, not the destination. And even when it comes to the great apostle Paul, God didn't give him a roadmap with the destination. He says to Paul, just be obedient and I'm going to guide you along the way. I remember in in 2009 coming back from Israel and uh, we decided to get cable and we had been gone for a little bit and something new had developed It was called DVR. So we were handed a remote like this, and the technician who was at our house said, okay, this is how DVR, digital video recording, works. 
He said you don't have to be in front of your television anymore to record a television show. Uh, if you're watching live TV, you can pause live television, you can rewind live television, you can fast forward to the present moment of that television show. And I was sitting there going, this is remarkable. Uh, many of us remember the days that if we wanted to watch a television show, we actually had to be at home in front of the television when it came on in order to watch it. Or for some of us, we'll remember all the way back like recording on a VHS tape, okay? Dinosaur technology right there. But now you have DVR and it gives you control over something that you didn't have control of before. And what is true of DVR and what was true of DVR is true of any technological advance today. Every advance in technology has a byproduct, if you will, or even you could say, this is the point, to give us more control over that which we didn't have as much control of before. Now, I'm not down on technology. So much of technology is fantastic. You just have to understand what it has done for us, is it's given us a false sense of control. Because here's what happens, everything that we have in our life that is technology driven, that gives us more control over something that we didn't have control of before, gives us this idea that we have more control over things than what we actually do. And God is not like a DVR. God is not like a cable company. God doesn't give us all the information. And when we are interacting with God and we don't have the control to know what is to come or how things are gonna happen or whatnot, it causes us to be frustrated with God when he doesn't afford us the same level of control that our cable company does, or our streaming service, or our cell phone, our, our app on weather, or whatever it is. And so the question becomes in the midst of all of this is, how do we journey well when we don't know the destination? Because this is the tension, isn't it? We want to know what's 5,000 steps down the road, but we don't get that. So how do we journey well in the midst of not even knowing where the journey is going? Well, I believe that the ancient rabbis can help us with a really important understanding in life. Uh, Genesis 1.1, we can all recite this from memory, in the beginning God created. Now, most of us can do that in English, but maybe few of us can do that from Hebrew. It starts like this, Bereshit bara Elohim. The first word is Bereshit, because you read from right to left with Hebrew. Now, one of the interesting things about the ancient rabbis is they asked all of these penetrating questions about the text. They were like spiritual detectives. They asked questions about everything. And some of the questions to us may seem a bit bizarre or taking things too far. So, for example, one of the questions that was asked was, well, why does God begin the first book of the Bible, a book about the beginning, using a word whose first letter isn't the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet, which is the letter Aleph. Instead, it's the second letter, which is the Hebrew letter Beit. So why did God do this? Why not begin with a word that has an Aleph to begin if it's about a beginning and it's about life? And one of the discussions they concluded with the idea that the letter bait is actually a picture of life. And they said, if you were to stand in the middle of the letter, and again, you read Hebrew from right to left, so this is forward, they said that you can't go up, you can't go down, and you can't go back, right? You can't go back in the past. The only way that you can go is forward, and you can only do so one step at a time. And so when we're asking a question and seeking to answer, how do we journey well when we don't know the destination? The concept for this episode today is we take the next right step. And then when we take that next step, then we take the step after that and the step after that and the step after that. 
See, again, the challenge that we have is that we want to know the destination. We want to know 5,000 steps down the road. But paradoxically, if we knew where maybe some of these paths were going, we may not be faithful in even taking steps down that path. Uh, I recently had a friend just yesterday, we weren't even talking about this teaching. They were just talking to me about their life and they just said, I've just been struggling a lot lately because I believe God's called me into something, but is not giving me very many details. And it's like, I've been asking God, I want to know where is this going? Basically what they were saying is give me the destination. And they said to me just yesterday, they said, yeah, I feel like God is saying that I couldn't handle where the path is going. And I thought, that's encouraging. That may also be a bit discouraging as well. But the whole idea was God was inviting them to take the next step, not to figure out 5,000 steps down the road. Uh, The late, great John Wooden, who was not only a phenomenal basketball coach, but a passionate follower of Jesus, who helped lots of other people become more faithful followers of Jesus. But as it related to coaching and as it related to development, I love this quote from John Wooden. He said this, he says, When you improve a little each day, eventually big things occur. Don't look for the quick, big improvement. Seek the small improvement one day at a time. That's the only way it happens. And when it happens, it lasts. Oh, such brilliant wisdom right there. Because what he is saying here is that if we learn to be faithful with the next right step, and then we're faithful with the next right step, and then the next right step, the path will then lay itself out. Where God has taken us will lay, us, will lay it out, but in the process will become a kind of person where we will have developed strength, we will have developed wisdom, we will have developed trust. And where that path is going, it's going to be substantial. It's going to last the change that is happening within us because we are entrusting ourselves to God. We're saying, God, even though I don't have all of the details, even though I don't have the roadmap, even though I don't have the destination, I will trust you and I will recognize that you're not even asking me to figure out the destination. That what we're called to is simply the next right step. And I don't know about you, but a next right step feels a whole lot easier than trying to figure out the entire thing. And yet that's the paradox of what we often demand of God is we want the whole thing. And God's saying, but that's not for you to figure out. What you are called to is the next right step. Uh, I remember when I was in seminary, my first year, I was really struggling. And I had this great opportunity to spend a couple of hours with this fantastic gentleman who was incredibly wise. And we actually went to a breakfast diner and sat in a booth just like this. And as we were there, he was just asking me, you know, how are you doing? How is seminary going? And it was like, all of my anxiety like bubbled to the surface and I just started to like vomit my anxiety all over him. I just said to him, I said, listen, I, I, I'm doing fine and seminary is going well, but I have no idea where this is all leading. Like I, I didn't even go to seminary to become a pastor. Like I just wanted to better understand the Bible. And now that I'm a year in a seminary, it's like, you got to try to figure out, well, where is this going? What are you going to become? And I said, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know if I, if I want to be a pastor. And if I'm going to be a pastor, am I going to be a, a senior pastor? Am I going to be an associate pastor? Should I be, you know, a youth pastor? And if I'm not a pastor, then, then should I be a teacher? Should I teach like high school or junior high or or should I think about being at the collegiate level? Or, or what about trips? Like maybe, maybe I should do trips. And I'm just like, blah, 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 blah. and he's like, Brad, slow down for a moment. I hadn't even realized how fast I was talking. And he said, Let's just pause for a moment. And he says, let me just ask you this question. He says, what do you believe that you're called to do? And I said, I believe I'm called to teach the Bible. That's all I know today. He says, great. He says, then your responsibility is to become the very best teacher you can possibly become. And then you let God channel where all of your teachings are going to go. Whether that's a pastor, whether that's a teacher, whether that's a trip leader, you let God take care of that. This is what you know today. 
So what's the next step you need to take into accomplishing what you know you're called to become? It was a moment where it was all about how do you take the next right step? Because that's all we're called to. And that's what God is inviting us into. So how about you? Uh, Where have you been demanding the manifest from God? Where are you struggling to take a step in the right direction because you're waiting for all 5,000 steps? Uh, Where has God been calling you, but you have been reluctant to begin? What does that next right step look like for you? Uh, Maybe for some of you, you know exactly what that is. Maybe for some of you, you just need to say, Dear God, I know that I need to be doing this or I need to be moving this direction. I just don't know how to get there. Will you help me to see what that next right step is because when we take the next right step we can take the step after that and the step after that and our journey will continue and God will help us to be kind become the kind of people he wants us to be as we engage this journey mindset so friends take the next right step that is what you are called to do along the journey. So friends, thanks so much for watching. Thanks for listening. May you walk out the text well in your life.